In this video we're going to continue our look at derivative securities. Last lecture we looked at forwards and futures. Now we're going to look at options. There are two basic types of options, call options and put options. With a call option the holder has the right but not the obligation to buy a given quantity of some asset at some time in the future at a price that is agreed upon today. So this preserves upside potential. The holder has the right but not the obligation to buy at some fixed price that you agree today. So if the price of the asset rises above the price you agree today, you will exercise the call option and buy the asset at the cheaper price that you agree today. If, however, the price falls below the price you've agreed to buy at, because it's an option, you can just say, I'm not exercising the option, and you can buy the asset at the price it is in the market, rather than buying at the price you agreed upon. That's the nice thing about option contracts. That's what makes them different from forwards and futures. With a forward contract, you are locked in. You have to trade at the pre-agreed price, whatever happens. With the option contract, you have the option not to trade. With a call option, it's the right but not the obligation to buy the asset in the future. With a put option, it gives the holder the right but not the obligation to sell a given quantity of some asset at some time in the future at a price agreed upon today. This provides a lower bound on the value of an asset. We have to get through a bit of options terminology before we can look at any examples. The price that we agree upon today is normally referred to as K and it's called the strike price or the exercise price. Now when we dealt with forwards and futures the value of the forward contract or the futures contract at initiation was zero. But with options that's not true because with options we don't have to go through with the deal if we don't want to. That means that the option has a positive value at all times. The price of the option at initiation is called the premium. When you hear people talking about options premium, they're talking about the price of the option. If you exercise an option, that means you execute the option contract. You agree to it and you actually go through and you either buy or sell the asset at the agreed price. Expiration is the date at which the option must be exercised or it becomes worthless. If the expiration date is one year, then the option has to be exercised either at the end of the year or before the end of the year. After the end of the year, the option is worthless. There are two common types of exercise style, European and American. European options can be exercised only on the expiration date. American style options can be exercised at any time before the expiration date. To get a good idea of how options work, it's a good idea to work through a few examples. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to go back to our football example from the last video lecture. We have this signed football that Scott got at a charity event. He only paid $50 for it. And all the Iowa team signed it. But Scott's a Nebraska fan, so he doesn't really care too much about the Iowa football team and doesn't think that this football will be worth much. Chad, however, is an Iowa fan. And he pays Scott $10 today for the option to buy the football for $90 in five years' time. This is a call option. Chad has paid $10, that's the premium, for the option to buy the football in for $90. $90 is the strike price, K, and this option expires in five years' time. So the expiration date is five years. And Chad only has the option to buy in five years' time. He can't buy the football at any point within the five years. It has to be at the end of five years. So it's a European call option. 
What does the payoff profile look like for Chad? Chad has gone long the call option. He has the right but not the obligation to buy the football at a price of $90 in five years time. On the horizontal axis we have the spot price or the value of the football in five years time. We have the strike price K equal to $90. Now let's think about the value of the signatures and the football. If the football is only worth $40 in five years time is Chad going to want to pay $90 for the football? Well, the answer is no. And he has that option. He doesn't have to go through with the deal. That's the nice thing about the call option. Chad has the right but not the obligation to buy the football at $90. So if the football's only worth $40, Chad is not going to exercise the option. So the payoff from the option is zero. If the price of the football is $89, is Chad going to exercise his option? No, there's no need to. Why would you pay $90 for something that is only worth $89? So once again, the value of the option is zero. Now suppose the football is worth $120. Is Chad going to exercise the option now? Yes. Chad can exercise the option and buy the football at $90 when in fact it should be worth $120. His payoff is $30. If the football is worth $150, Chad gets a payoff of $60. The profit, though, differs. The profit is not the same as the payoff. The payoff didn't consider the fact that Chad paid $10 at the contract initiation for this option. So the profit at maturity of this contract has to be equal to the payoff minus the future value of the option premium. Now remember Chad paid $10 premium five years ago. What's the future value going to be? Well, the future value is going to be equal to the present value times by 1 plus, in this case we'll go with the risk-free rate, to the power 5, because we've got 5 years. So it would be 10 times by 1 plus RF to the power 5. That would be how we calculate the future value of the option premium. In the examples that I'm going to work through, we're not going to need to do that to calculate the profit. It's more important to understand the payoff profile. But just remember, the payoff is not the same thing as the profit. The profit is always going to be equal to the payoff minus the future value of the option premium when we're long a call. We have a bit more terminology to deal with. If the value of the football is less than the strike price, so if the value of the football is less than $90, the call option is said to be out of the money. At the contract initiation, Scott paid, what, $50 for the ball? The ball is worth $50 today. So Chad has purchased an out-of-the-money call option because $50 is less than the $90 strike price. If the football was worth $90 today and the strike price was $90, we would say that the option is at the money. And if the football was worth more than $90 today, we would say that the option is in the money. We've now dealt with Chad's payoffs and profits from the call. What about Scott's payoffs and profits? He sold this call option. What is his payoff? Well, Scott's payoff is the reverse of Chad's. Scott does not have any options. Chad has all the options in terms of he can decide whether he exercises the contract or not. Scott doesn't have that option. Scott has to do whatever Chad says. Now we know what Chad is going to do. 
If the football is worth less than $90, Chad is not going to be interested in exercising the option. So the option has zero value. That means Scott's payoff is also zero. If, however, the football is worth more than $90, we know that Chad will exercise the option because that means he can buy at $90 even though the true value is more than that. This is where Scott's going to have a negative payoff because Scott has to give Chad the ball for $90 even though he could sell it for more. For example, if the ball is really worth $120, Scott has no choice but to give the ball to Chad for $90. That's what the option contract requires. This would mean that Scott's payoff would be minus 30, while Chad's payoff would be plus 30. Why would anyone write this call option? Why would Scott enter into this agreement? The reason Scott is willing to enter into this contract is because he receives a premium initially from Chad of $10. The profit for Scott is the future value of the option premium, so the future value of $10 plus the payoff. Scott's hoping the payoff will be zero. In other words, the option will expire worthless. That way he makes just the future value of the option premium. If the football is worth more than the $90, then Scott has to think that he has the value of the option premium plus whatever the payoff is. And for Scott, the payoff is going to be negative. Now let's consider a put option. Suppose Scott pays Chad $20 today for the option to sell the football to Chad for $90 in five years' time. This is a put option. The premium is $20 that Scott pays to Chad. The strike price is $90 again, the expiration is 5 years, and this is again a European option. Scott can exercise this option only on the expiration date in 5 years time. Who has all the, the rights here? It's Scott. Scott has purchased this option from Chad. So Scott can decide whether to exercise the option or not. Chad here has no options. He has to do what, whatever Scott says. What are the payoffs for Scott's position? Suppose the ball is worth more than $90 in five years' time. In fact, a few of the Iowa players do go on and play in the Super Bowl, and the ball is worth $120. Does Scott want to exercise his option to sell the football to Chad for $90? No, there's no reason to. Scott could sell it to someone else for $120 in the market. So Scott's not going to exercise the option. It's not worth anything to him. That's why the value or the payoff is set to zero. Suppose instead, though, that none of the Iowa team become successful. And in fact, the ball is only worth $20 in five years' time. Now what's Scott going to do? Is Scott going to want to sell the ball to Chad for 90 Yes, of course he is. This ball is worthless, but because of this put option, Scott can sell the ball to Chad for $90. That would mean Scott has a payoff of $70. What this does is it puts a flaw on the value of the football for Scott. Whatever happens, Scott will always be able to sell the ball for $90. And if the price goes up, Scott can sell the ball for more. So that's neat. We've put a flaw on the value of the football. The profit in this situation is going to be the payoff from the put option minus the future value of the option premium. This is similar to the profit calculation we use when dealing with a call option. If you buy the option, then your profit is going to be equal to the payoff minus the future value of the option premium. If the football is worth less than the $90, the strike price, 
then we would say the put option is in the money. When this contract was initiated, the value was at $50. This put option is an in the money put option at initiation. If the football was worth more than $90, we would say the put option is out of the money. Now let's look at Chad's payoffs. Chad wrote this put option and he's going to have to do whatever Scott says. If the price is above $90 in five years time, Scott's not going to do anything. Scott is not going to exercise this option. So the payoff is zero. If, however, the price is less than $90 in five years time, Scott's going to exercise the option and sell to Chad for $90. That means Chad will have to pay out and buy the football for $90, even if the football is only worth 20. In this case, Chad would have a payout of minus $70. The profit for Chad is going to be equal to the future value of the option premium minus the payoff. Why would Chad agree to write this put option? Well, Chad is very positive about the Iowa football team and he's convinced that a few of these players will go on to the NFL and win the Super Bowl. So he thinks there's going to be quite a lot of value to this football in the future. One way that he can realize that value is by writing a put option. And what this means is that he gets $20 today from Scott because Scott is willing to pay $20 for the right to sell the football for $90 in the future. Chad thinks the ball is going to be worth more than $90 in the future. So this option, in Chad's view, is never going to be exercised. But Chad is able to get $20 today by writing this option. That's why Chad's willing to enter into this agreement. Technology firms in the 1990s wrote an awful lot of put options on their own stock. This was a period when there was a tech bubble and technology stocks were going up and up in value. All these tech firms were very bullish about their prospects and they thought that writing put options was just a way to make more money. They kept writing put options, investors kept buying the put options and giving them the premium, and the tech firms just assumed the stock prices would keep going up and that they would never actually have to pay out any money on these put options. In the early 2000s, they found out this wasn't the case. Stock prices didn't keep going up. In fact, tech stocks fell in value. And it turned out to cost a lot of tech firms huge amounts of money. Both Microsoft and Intel, very big tech firms, lost money from these put options that they wrote. We've now covered the basics of futures, forwards and options. These are the key building blocks for any derivative products. There are lots of complicated products out there. We're going to start looking at those products in the next few lectures. But for now, that's everything I wanted to talk about. See you in class.